Okay, let's start. We're going to do a class on Emmanuel Levinas. Anybody hear of him, by the way, before him? Anybody hear of Levinas before? You did, you did Sam? How did you hear about him? Um, I actually took the class where we talked about him briefly. Um, I don't know, it was a, a Jewish philosophy class, so we did uh, him and Derrida, who I always thought seemed a bit out of place. Uh, <laughs> they were good friends, by the way. They were, written, they were such good friends, you should know, that when Levinas died at his kvura, at his, uh, sem at his burial, Derrida was given the honors of being the main person to give the hespit, to give the, the, uh, the celebration of his life, uh, which was published eventually. It's called Adieu, which you know, in French means goodbye, but when you break it up, it means Adieu, to God. You know, Derrida has this double meaning. Okay, so what did, you, what did you read by Levinas, by the way, at that time? Uh, I honestly don't remember. I took this my sophomore year at, in college. Um, it may actually have been excerpts from this book. I would have, could probably go dig it up if I wanted to. Uh, That's okay. Just curious. This, this is his most, uh, probably his most quoted book. He had two major books. This was, this was the first one. And it's the book that put him on the map basically as, as, a, as a philosopher. Until then, well, he, he had been known actually in, in French circles um, as, as a philosopher ever since his youth when he, when he uh, published a work on, on Husserl, which we'll look at in a second. I want to look at his, in his life. But, but this was the book that really that made him famous. It took a little bit of time, of course. You know, philosophical works are difficult, and this one is, is uh, extremely difficult to read, unfortunately. Uh, but, but he did become what many would say, this is not my Kiddush to say this, I think many people would agree that Emmanuel Levinas was the greatest philosopher, greatest Jewish philosopher of the second half of the 20th century. And I want to emphasize, I mean, we've done already two, two classes together on, on Jewish philosophers. We did Hermann Cohen and Martin Buber. Uh, so I just want to emphasize this again, that Jewish philosophy should not be confused with what's called Jewish thought. In, in some departments, uh, I believe in Hebrew U, there are two separate departments. Uh, th that's an old distinction. Well, it's not that old. As far as I know, it was a distinction that was made by, uh, by Rav Kook between Machshevet Israel, Jewish thought, and Jewish philosophy. The difference being that Jewish thought is thinking in Hebrew or Yiddish, uh, thinking and writing in Hebrew or Yiddish in such a way that taps into the Jewish sources and the Jewish tradition immediately and doesn't necessarily make any overt reference to Plato or Aristotle or the philosophical tradition. It often does make covert references, sometimes without even knowing it. There are certain words that are commonly used, for example, in Kabbalah. Kabbalah, uh, Hasidut, would, could, would be classified under Jewish thought. And in Kabbalah, you get, for example, the four elements, earth, air, fire, water, which as most people know is, a, is an ancient Greek idea, a pre-Socratic idea that comes from Empedocles and the pre-Socratics before him. Um, and you find it, for example, in Atanya, earth, air, fire, water as principles of the soul. Also a, a term, a very often used term, uh, Huli, they usually say it in yeshiva, uh, Huli is a term that's used in describing the creation of the world as the primordial matter, the primordial chaotic matter. And it's a term that comes straight out of Aristotle. Hule in ancient Greek is a word that means, originally means wood, but it comes to mean matter. Uh, so Kabbalah in Jewish thought, Machshevet Israel, will often use terms that are borrowed from non-Jewish philosophy, but it is very much a a, a, a deeply Jewish approach to Jewish texts, and it's a Jewish thinking, whereas Jewish philosophy is not. Jewish philosophy is very much a Greek endeavor. It's a, it, it, philosophy, as you know, starts in ancient Greece, in however you want to date it, there's such a thing called pre-Socratic philosophy, which really begins in the sixth century before the common era, but philosophy proper, which is basically Socrates and and Plato begins in the, in the fourth century before the Common Era. And that mode of thinking, which is initiated by Socrates, 
con continues until this day, it, it, taken up by different nationalities and different languages, but the basic gestures of philosophical thinking are really Greek. For example, logic. If you want to, you know, philosophers from very early days insisted that it's necessary to think logically. You have to observe the law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle, things like that. You shouldn't contradict yourself, in other words, when you speak. Uh, this is a Greek idea, which is not to say that Jews contradict themselves when they speak, but Jews are not afraid in, when, when, for example, in Hasidic thinking, you, you, we speak about uh, something which is lemala min hadat, above reason, there it's possible to contradict oneself, and it's even necessary if you're going to have truly profound thoughts. But philosophy is much more respectful of the laws that it set down at the beginning. Um, and even though it underwent different transformations, ultimately it's, it is a Greek style of thinking. And so Jewish philosophy is a Greek way of thinking about Judaism. It's not really, it's unlike Machshevet Israel, which is a Jewish way of thinking about Judaism. So when we look through this book, Totality and Infinity, first of all, you'll notice if you looked at it at all, you have it in Hungarian translation, right? Yes. Bracha, you, you also got it also, yeah? I yes. I it to her this summer. Yeah, so we're going to look at it in English translation, which is very good because English is incredibly close to French by comparison with Hungarian. Uh, uh, so, and, and even closer than, for example, German. So, probably not as close as Spanish and, and, Latin, and uh, Italian, but it's, it, we only need to refer to the original French every once in a while. On the whole, the English translation is very, very good, and I, I hope the, you'll, you know, you'll point out if the Hungarian translation is, doesn't match the English, and then we'll check out what the, what the, the original French says. Um, yeah, so let's, let's, before getting into the book, let's say a little bit about Levinas's life. It's always interesting to talk about the philosophers' lives. Uh, not just interesting, I think it's actually essential to understand, to understand the ideas of the philosopher. You have to understand where he or she is coming from in their actual life context. Um, so Levinas was by birth, not French, although his, even his name sounds a little bit French, but Lithuanian. He is born in uh, Kovno, or Kaunas, which is uh, the second major city in Lithuania after Vilnius. His date of birth, depending on how you reckon it, is either December 30th, 1905, or January 12th, 1906. The discrepancy is simply that at that time, it, Lithuania was still a part of Tsarist Russia, and the calendar that they were using was the Julian calendar rather than the Gregorian. So in the records it's 1905, but uh, from our, in, in our calendar it's 1906. Uh, Tsar Nikolai II was the last Tsar of Russia and in, in control of Lithuania at that time. And that's, as you know, I, I, you guys in Hungary have a lot of negative things, things to say about Russians, mostly from the communist era. <laughs> uh, at, at that time, as you can imagine, anyone who was under the Russian Empire, who wasn't Russian per se, was not exactly happy about it. So the Lithuanian gubernia, as they called it, just like you know the Polish and the so on, uh, they were part of the empire and uh, different degrees of being disgrun disgruntled about being a part of the great Russian Empire. But regardless of the political situation, What's important for us and for Levinas is the literary situation. Levinas grew up uh, in a highly literary milieu. His father owned a, a stationery shop, a, a stationery shop slash bookstore in Kovno. And they were rather literary people. His aunt actually was the, the head librarian of the of library of Kovno. And uh, for them, literature was Russian literature. I'm not, I'm sure there is Lithuanian literature, I'm not aware of any, uh, but as you obviously know, Russian literature is, whether we like it or not, one of the great, great literary bodies of, of uh, Western literature. So in their house they had a, almost a religious worship, for example, of Tolstoy. When Tolstoy died, the family was, you know, they, they, they were, 
they, they lit candles and they, and they basically said Kaddish uh, for Tolstoy. And then, you know, they, it was a, a momentous event for them in their family. He was also a very big fan of, of Dostoevsky his whole life. Also of Gogol and Pushkin and so on. Um, and he, that was effectively his mother tongue. We'll talk about his wife in a minute. Uh, when he got married, uh, he spoke Russian at home. He and his wife spoke Russian with each other. So that was their, their homiest, I, I guess, language. Although he was an incredible polyglot. He spoke many languages. He learned them very quickly and spoke them well. And, you know, his literary career is essentially in French. He had two little brothers, uh, Boris and Amina Dov. Boris's name, I think, was uh, Dov. His Hebrew name is Dov. Uh, and uh, the family was traditional. You know, in, Euro in Europe, that was something that was very common. It's really not so common in American Judaism. In America, you really have to belong to, uh, to uh, one of the sets, one of the well-defined sets of Judaism. If you're not Orthodox, you're conservative, you're reform, or you don't give a damn and you're nothing, you're, you're, you're assimilated. Uh, but it's very rare that you would have a phenomenon which is very common in, at that time in Europe. And also, uh, my wife is Moroccan, a very f common phenomenon in Morocco, which doesn't really have a name. People often refer to it as traditional Judaism. In other words, keeping, they would keep kosher at home, they would keep Shabbat, but they wouldn't walk around wearing a kippah in the street. Uh, not, or they weren't, or, or tzitzit, not necessarily visibly Jewish, but basically respectful of the tradition. Um, he went to, the school that he went to was actually a Jewish school, which initially taught in both Hebrew and Russian. They had half a day in Russian, half a day, like Maimonides here. Well, actually here they learn in Hungarian and in English, but... In some schools, they will learn in the, in the language of the land and in Hebrew. Eventually, though, the school did actually switch to Hebrew as its language of instruction in all subjects, including secular subjects. So Levinas was, from, a, from an early age, he was fluent in Hebrew. He was once invited to speak at, I think it was either Hebrew University of, or Ben Gurion, I don't remember which. And uh, he was invited to give a lecture in his, when he was already a fairly well-known thinker. And apparently he was very disappointed that they would not, did not want him to speak in Hebrew. They wanted him to lecture in French, and he was very proud of his Hebrew. He said, I want to actually lecture in Hebrew, but he ended up lecturing in French. I definitely know he, he met Adin Steinsaltz uh, once in his, in his home, uh, or in the home, rather, of Salomon Malka, who was a, wrote a biography about him. And um, I actually had, um, I met I met Steinsaltz, the one time I had a com proper conversation with the Dean Steinsaltz in the old city in Jerusalem. I asked him about uh, this meeting, about Levinas. He looked at me, he said, how do you know that I had this meeting with Levinas in a private apartment? I said, well, yeah, you know, I translated this, this uh, biography of, of his uh, from French, and there's a chapter in there about their meeting. And during their meeting, they spoke Hebrew. So his Hebrew was, was good enough for him to actually have a conversation with, with, uh, with Adin Steinsaltz in Hebrew. He, because of Lithuania, I don't know if you know this, I don't know much about Lithuanian Jewish history, Lithuania is famous, even today, for its yeshivot. You've probably heard the distinction, you know, between Hasidim and sometimes what are called misnagdim, but are also called litvak, litvak Jews. Right? Sam, for example, is a, comes from a good litvak tradition, a good litvak yeshiva tradition. And very basically, the litvaks, as opposed to the Hasidim, are people, are Jews who focused on study, on studying of, of the Talmud in particular, and studying the, the oral tradition, whereas Hasidim preferred to drink mashke and to dance. That's, a, that's an oversimplification, of course. Uh, today, the distinction is not that big anymore. The Lit Lit Litvak Jews are rather Hasidic, and Hasidic Jews are rather Litvak. They've each learned from each other. But, but initially, in the beginning of, of this history, the, these people, the, these two camps came to blows, quite literally. It wasn't just uh, uh, intellectual polemics between the two, but it was actually fistfights would break out in the street and in, and in, and in, in, uh, in, 
pubs, maybe not pubs, but wherever Jews hung out to, 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 to drink and to say L'chaim together. Volozhin, uh, which is not far as you can see on this map, Kaunas, Kovnos here, Vilnius or Vilna is in the middle between, between Kaunas and Volozhin. Volozhin was the site of the first great yeshiva, and, uh, and I mean that and I, I, the word should be taken quite literally, even though, of course, the, there was Jewish, Jewish schools existed forever, ever since uh, Moses came down from Mount Sinai. But the concept of yeshiva as we know it, a place which is, has an organized curriculum of study where boys travel from far and they live in dorms and they study all day long, this system of Jewish education originated in in Volozhin. It was the brainchild of Chaim Volozhiner. Reb Chaim Volozhiner was the, the primary student of the great Vilna Gaon. You probably have heard that name. Uh, the Gaon of Vilna, uh, the genius, the, the word Gaon means genius. The, the Gaon of Vilna was the, the great, probably the greatest the Talmudic scholar of his magnitude, I would say, since him. There have been great geniuses of Talmudic learning, but probably nobody that quite matches him on his level. We're talking, of course, about a person who had an absolutely photographic memory, um, knew the Talmud and the entire tradition, Jewish tradition inside out, and had tremendous powers of analysis, and, um, and was a staunch opponent of Hasidism. Over time, again, the, the, that entire tradition, which goes down through Volozhin, through Brisk, and whatever, as I say, the, the tension between them rela relaxed, but initially, the relationship between Hasidism, which was, as we know, one of the great movements of European Judaism, and Litvak Judaism was, was uh, you know, was, was, was of catastrophic proportions. And it, and, and, the, and the center of, of Litvak Judaism was this yeshiva founded in, in 1803 in Volozhin, and I believe it was closed down either 1933 or 1939 probably, right at the beginning of the Second World War, if, if I'm not mistaken. And why am I mentioning this? Is, this is very important uh, on... It's a, it's a very important aspect of Emmanuel Levinas's intellectual makeup. Levinas was, was not, did not just grow up in this Litvak environment, but he was quite aware of it and quite proud of it, and very much wanted to maintain himself within that intellectual tradition. Um, he did not know much about Hasidism, although once, I, I, I wish I could find this again, I, once in the U of T library in my alma mater in University of Toronto, I was looking through these French magazines, uh, French intellectual magazine, I think the one it was Arche, and I found an article in which Levinas was interviewed, and somebody asked him about Hasidism, and he said, yeah, well, you know, Hasidism is really not my cup of tea, although there is a, there's a thing called Chabad. I don't think he knew anything about Chabad, but he knew the word Chabad, and he said, he said it's interesting that there is a branch of Hasidism called Chabad, and the word Chabad stands for Chochma Bin Adas, three names for the three faculties of intelligence, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And he says, and it's interesting that even in Hasidism, you do find an intellectually oriented tradition, which this made him very happy, of course, because to his mind, Hasidism was associated with emotional excess and effervescence, and he was more interested in a, in a staunch intellectual approach of the, of the, of the, Vilna, of the Vilna Gaon and the Volozhiner. Uh, in fact, Levinas wrote an introduction to the, I don't want to say the magnum opus, although there is no other writing, there's not much uh, that the Volozhin left behind by, by way of, of Talmudic analysis, which was his forte, but the Volo Chaim Volozhin did write a book which is believed to be, and I kind of agree with this opinion, it is believed to be an answer to Hasidism. It's an, a kind of implicit attack on Hasidism, and in particular on the Tanya of the, of the Alter Rebbe, of the founder of Chabad Hasidism. Uh, but it is a book that is, it's only implicitly that, because it's a beautiful mystical work, which we are actually gonna look at together with Elliot Wilson, 
when he comes here from, uh, from California, who is one of the, the world renowned, living world renowned experts on, on Kabbalah. And he's actually going to give, give us a course here on the Nefesh Chaim by the Chaim of Elosian. In the, French, in the French translation of the Nefesh Chaim, for this French translation, which was done by Benjamin Gross, Benjamin Gros, or Gross, so the preface was written by Emmanuel Levinas. Levinas gives a lovely little introduction to the Nefesh Chaim, L'âme de la vie, in which he makes clear his affiliations with not just the Litvak approach to, to Judaism, but specifically with the Nefesh Chaim this text by the Nefesh Chaim. And if, we'll have an occasion, I hope, to point out uh, some of the important themes in the Nefesh Chaim that are, that are implicitly at work in, in Levinas, in totality and infinity. So Levinas leaves uh, his home, home, his Heimat, in 1923 as a young man. Uh, he goes to Strasbourg, which is on the border between Germany and France. It's in France, but it's on the border with Germany. If anyone's visited Strasbourg, you know, it's one of those unique cities where they speak both French and German. We had, uh, we had a student here from Strasbourg, as you remember, last year. Um, and in Strasbourg, he, first thing, of course, first order of business is to learn French. So this is a, a man, a young man, who speaks, who speaks Lithuanian, Russian, uh, probably some German, if, if not Yiddish, but certainly Russian very fluently. He's reading Tolstoy and Gogol in Russian. He speaks Hebrew very well. And now he throws himself into French to study French. And in fact, within six years, he masters the French language so beautifully that he produces a French translation of Edmond Husserl's Cartesian Meditations. So this is a guy who learns languages incredibly quickly. He makes uh, friends which are very important in his lifetime. Probably most important is, uh, is uh, Maurice Blanchot, who was, a, in his own right, a great French intellectual. This is a picture of the two of them as, as uh, young students, uh, probably around 1925. And apparently on the back of this photograph is uh, somebody who written the words double patte et patachon, which were a, a kind of French comic pair, much like Laurel and Hardy. Or as, uh, when I was a kid, you know, my, fa my father in Romanian used to call them Stan Shibran. I don't know what you call them in Hungarian. What do you call them? Stan Eshbran. Stan I had a feeling. Bon. That, what is it? Bon. Oh, Bon. Okay. Bon. Bon? Bon? bon. 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 Like pen, but we don't. Stan Eshbran. Bon. Yeah. I had a feeling it would be like Romanian. So we, <laughs> my papa called them Stan Shibran, which were basically double pate patachon. So the, this is... Um, the Laurel and Hardy, the intellectual Laurel and Hardys of, of, a French, uh, of the French scene. Uh, they actually had an interesting relationship uh, because uh, Blanchot, they're very unlike, a very f funny pair. Blanchot was a bit of an aristocrat, a French aristocrat. And uh, like many aristocrats during the war, talking about the Second World War now, uh, Many aristocrats, as you probably know, and I know it's like this in Hungary as well, because I've met somebody who, 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 who derived from aristocratic Hungarian blood. And aristocrats tend to be right-wing, you know, tend to be a little bit right-wing in their politics. And so Blanchot started to write some very hot right-wing uh, treatises and pamphlets, which aggravated Levinas, of course, terribly, because Levinas, a Jew, living in France in the early 1930s, of course, could not afford to be a right-wing thinker and it caused him a, a distress. However, it's worth noting that the same man, uh, Blanchot, even though he was writing these things, and by the way, he later, regret, after the war, Second World War, he regretted his writings, his right-wing writings terribly. During the Second World War, Blanchot took Levinas's wife and daughter into his protection, into his house, and thanks to him, they, they survived the war. Um, here's another photograph from the same period. You can see Blanchot here is sitting on the, on the car uh, with his walking stick, very fashionable at the time, and Levinas is bestriding the hood of the car. This is a group of students uh, who were just about to go visit uh, also an important uh, psychology professor at that time, Charles Blondel. Uh, 
Not long thereafter, Levinas moves to Freiburg in Breisgau, 1928 to 1929. He spends, uh, I think, just over a year in Freiburg, which was uh, at that time probably the, the center of where philosophy was really happening, although Berlin is always really a great cultural center. But Freiburg at that time was home to Edmund Husserl, who was without question the greatest German philosopher of that period and played a tremendous role in, in Levinas's life. Husserl was the founder of a philosophical mode of thinking called phenomenology. Um, and as you've looked, if you've looked at the text, uh, Levinas mentions it quite a bit. Levinas was actually responsible for bringing Husserl into the French scene. Uh, at that time, Husserl was very widely known in, the Ger in Germany, of course, uh, because of his phenomenological writings. And we'll have to talk about what exactly phenomenology is. Um, and Levinas was his student, was his personal student. Not only was he a student, but Husserl at that and during those years was preparing to a, a, a series of lectures which became quite, quite famous, a series of lectures which he delivered in Paris. They were called the Meditation Cartesien, the Cartesian Meditations. So by the name you can tell they were meditations on, on the philosophy of René Descartes. Uh, and Levinas, for that occasion, translated these Cartesian Meditations into French so that I believe Husserl, his French was good enough to be able to, to deliver them in French, but not good enough for him, for him to actually write them in French. So Levinas translated them into French and wrote his first book on Husserl and, and thereby made Husserl a name, a philosophical name in France. Also, what's uh, a nice little anecdote, or actually not so nice, is that <clears throat> at that time in preparation for their trip to Paris, Levinas gave private French lessons to Husserl's wife. Uh, his French was good enough, obviously, to give French lessons. Um, and there's one um, anecdotal and unple unpleasant little story <clears throat> about his wife. It's apparently, at some point during these French lessons, Husserl's wife, who was not Jewish, made some kind of remark about Levinas being the son of a shopkeeper in Lithuania, which, of course, is code for Jew. Uh, and uh, Mr. Husserl, Edmund Husserl, was very embarrassed by the whole thing and somehow under his breath muttered to Levinas, he said, no, uh, never mind, Herr Levinas, I too am the son of shopkeepers. Husserl himself, of course, was Jewish. His wife was not, but he himself was Jewish. And Levinas, of course, is Jewish. Husserl's most important, most influential student in history was a man known by, uh, by the name of Martin Heidegger, who is somebody that uh, I spent a little bit of time with posthumously. Uh, Heidegger was probably the greatest philosopher of the 20th century. If you had to choose one, one name, it really would be Heidegger. Uh, so even though he was Husserl's student, he overshadowed him. Heidegger is a tremendous force in Levinas's thinking and writing in a negative way. Uh, as you can see from this photograph, I don't know if you notice, in this picture, there's a little insignia that Heidegger is sporting on his lapel, which is, of course, the insignia of National Socialists. So Heidegger was, was a card-carrying National Socialist for a couple of months in 1933, 1934. I think it was four months. <clears throat> he, Heidegger renounced National Socialism even during... Uh, he, didn't, he didn't wait till the end of the war. He renounced it actually as a result of the, the Night of the Long Knives. Um, but he never really uh, addressed his own National Socialist inclinations throughout his whole life. And his thinking, as, as I have had occasion to, to argue, his thinking is on a deep level remained a kind of quasi-Nazi thinking. I don't think not Heidegger wasn't really... I think, I think too much noise has been made about Heidegger's anti-Semitism and his Nazism. I think it's, it's like blown way out of proportion. Uh, just, I think it's basically because Heidegger was such a great thinker. People, of course, when you meet somebody who's with such a stature, 
So it's a great pleasure to try to knock this person down. So it, it is blown out of proportion. However, however, having said that, I think, I, I think on a deep level, Heidegger was very much a, a Nazi, if, it, it, insofar as Nazism has a deep truth to it. Heidegger himself at one point says, talks about the inner, the inner truth, the, the innere Wahrheit und Größe uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of Nazism, the inner truth and greatness of Nazism. And I actually believe he's, I, I take him quite seriously on that. I really think there is such a thing as the inner truth of Nazism, unfortunately. And uh, Levinas is a thinker who, mm, you could read the whole of Levinas, I believe, as an attempt to, to fight, to counter this inner truth of Nazism, which he found and which I believe does exist in Heidegger. So Heidegger was very influential for Levinas, but as somebody that Levinas wrote against, specifically against Heidegger. He often in this book, in Totality and Infinity, he often mentions him, but, but even when he doesn't mention him, he's there implicitly, even in the title. But the idea of totality is very much, even though Heidegger would never, doesn't never use that word, but the, I, the, the word totalité in French, in English, totality is an implicit allusion to a Heideggerian outlook on life. Heidegger used the word being, and, and uh, uh, for Levinas, the, the concept of being is a, to, is a concept that suggests a, 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 an out, a world outlook which looks at totalities rather than what is beyond being, which is the title of second, Levinas' second book. I've been talking, droning on here. Any questions before I continue here? Here's, by the way, a picture of, of, of Husserl and Heidegger together in conversation somewhere in the Schwarzwald in the Black Forest. Yeah? Uh, so I assume we'll get into it at greater depth, but can you give us a, a like, I don't know, a 20-second summary about what the, uh, the great truth at the core of Nazism that both hmm. of them see is? I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll give it to you in, in Levinas's language. Um, he says, he, you know, and I, I follow Levinas, I, what do I follow? I, you know, I, I wrote a book on Heidegger, so in, in my book I very much follow Levinas's approach. I'm very, very, I personally am very sympathetic to Levinas's approach. So he, he basically calls Heidegger a pagan. He says Heidegger's a neo-pagan. And what that means for him is that his, Heidegger, Heidegger's thinking was, in, uh, was very much uh, about a kind of involvement in what he called the world, Welt, was uh, a deep involvement at the level of thought and spirit uh, with the world, which is not quite the same as nature, but let's say for our purposes you could think of it as, as a kind of neo-pagan it's not, this is not quite right. I'm simplifying things, right? Heidegger was, took the neo, the, what we associate as a neo-pagan involvement with nature, a celebration of nature, a, a, uh, a desire to participate in nature, to, to immerse oneself in the natural realm. Heidegger took that naturalism and raised it to a very sublime intellectual level. And he felt that Nazism was the was the gate to to reopen paganism, the truths, the ancient pagan truths, which, if you know a little bit about Nazism, about people like Goebbels, who were also interested in this type of thing. Goebbels was interested in, in, in a much more, you know, plebeian type of way, a much much simpler way. Um, and the Nazis had this they had this philosophy, which was pre-Nazi actually, of Blut und Boden, blood and soil connecting with the soil and with the blood of the people, uh, which has strong, strong pagan elements to, to it. Very, basically, everybody watch Vikings? You know the show on, 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 on Netflix, Vikings? It's a be I love this show. I think it's one of the best, Vikings is one of the best windows, as far as I can tell, I mean, into, into paganism. You see this profound love for the natural realm, which, which also is a love of death, a love of war, a love of human sacrifice. Um, and Heidegger is a, raised this to a kind of sub, a sublimated, it's a, into a sublime um, approach to reality. And Levinas, the Jew, begged to differ, obviously, right? For Judaism, 
paganism is is everything that Judaism would like to destroy. You know, Judaism, as you know from the beginning of the Torah, is very much preoccupied with destroying pagan altars, pagan forms of worship, pagan involvements in the natural realm. Judaism is about transcendence. It's about being standing in a relationship with God and being in a relationship with fellow human beings. And paganism is not. Not, certainly not in the way that Judaism is. And that's very much a theme here. What Levinas will call the face. The face is a concern with human others. Where the human being is not a natural being. The human being could become a natural being. In paganism, the whole project of paganism in a sense is to, is to return the human being to a kind of animal connection with nature. To reconnect through the animalism that is within us. What in Hasidut would be called the nefesh behamit, the animal soul, it's, it's, that's paganism. Paganism wants that, celebrates that, and Levinas, of course, strongly resists that as a Jew. It almost, and this, yeah. yeah, I was going to say it just seems like a, uh, I don't know, a kind of a a mirror image of Hispitidus in a way. Of? Uh, his oh, Hispitidus. Oh, yeah. How so? I, I don't know. I, I mean. I think the uh, uh, the methodology is very it strikes me as very similar, and the reverence of nature strikes me as similar. But I uh, oh, as in his Oh, you're saying yeah, because Rabbi Nachman would say, "Go out into the forest and commune with yourself, you know, in the wild, away from civilization." Yes and no. Yes, no. You know, even since the beginning of the Hasidic movement, the Baal Shem Tov was famous for, even as a child for having got, for making little jaunts into the forest in order to commune with God, using using nature as a kind of perhaps as a kind of medium to connect to God. However, however, we have to be careful. Um, it's not in Judaism. Nature is never anything more than a medium. Judaism, there are you will find in Ju- different Jewish texts different ways of celebrating nature as a a conduit to connecting with God. But it's never more than a conduit. Nature is only a telephone wire to get in touch with God. It's never never the end, it's never the destination. It cannot be. When nature becomes the destination, you have utterly uprooted Judaism and, 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 and brought it back into paganism. Arguably, somebody like Spinoza does that when he, when he says, Deus sive natura, God or nature, in a, in a pantheism that equates God and nature, that is a, uh, a, a destruction of Judaism and, and an attempt to return it back to some type of pagan conflation of God and nature. In Judaism, God, the hope, as we, as we read on Sibchat Torah, this is the beginning of the new year, we just started reading the book of the book, the Torah. The, what is the how, what does Judaism tell us at the beginning? It tells us God made nature. That's very important. That narrative order is very very important. Not nature. God. That's the first word. Let's talk about God. By the way, God made nature. Right? Nature is always secondary. Nature is nature follows from God. And in Judaism, are the the uh, the goal is always to reconnect to God. And, and the way to reconnect to God in Judaism, much, much, more, much, much more important con- conduit to that reconnection than nature is each other, is human beings, fellow human beings. And that actually is exactly what Levinas' philosophy is all about, what he calls the other and the face. How do we, re- we connect to each other? And nature, connection with nature actually obstructs that. It stands in the way. The more we, the more we worship nature, the more we want to be ecologically in tune, the less we actually are in tune with each other. As you know, by the way, this is anecdotal, but it does have some significance. As you know, Hitler, Yamachimo, loved dogs and animals. Was a vegetarian, in fact, right? So it's not an accident that people who love animals tend to have a difficult time with human beings. In fact, they'll sometimes admit that to you. Right? If they're honest enough, people who are really connected to their animals, I'm not, God, I, I had, I've had pets in my life, I'm not knocking pets, okay? I'm not knocking pets, but there are people who connect so deeply with the pets. And by the way, in Austria, when I lived in Austria for seven years, 
I've never seen people connected to, the pet, to their pets in the way that I've seen Austrians connected to their pets. So some people are so deeply connected to their pets that it's, a, that it's psychologically symptomatic of a weak connection to human beings. So there is a bit of a tension between our ability to connect to each other as higher life forms and animals. In Judaism, we're very racist, not racist, but we're chauvinist against animals that way, right? In, in Judaism, we're very clearly above animals. We have, no, there's no, we have no qualms about saying that. You can't say, oh yeah, us and animals, we're kind of the same. No, we're not the same. We are animals, that's true. We share with animals an animal identity, but we are definitely not animals. You know, if I kill somebody's cat, that's not a nice thing to do. And I may get, I may, I may get heavily fined for that, but that's not murder, it, right? It's not murder for me to kill a cat. It's wrong, but it's definitely not murder. Just like it's not murder, you know, for me to kill a chicken that I ate yesterday for supper. You know, some people feel it's wrong, but it's definitely not murder. So the human, the connection with humanity is definitely on a, on a higher order. Um, <clears throat> that was more than 20 seconds, Sam. Sorry. <laughs> uh, there was an interesting little event that was a watershed moment, not just for Levinas, but actually in, in 20th century philosophy, in 1929, there was a, what turned out to be a famous conference in the town of Davos. Or is it, I don't know if it's pronounced Davos or Davos. In French, I would say it's Davos, but people, I've heard people say Davos. So I don't know. If, uh, it's in Switzerland, a, a little resort town in the mountains in Switzerland. In 1921, at the Grand Hotel Belvedere, uh, there was a conference of philosophers from Europe in which the two main personalities there were, were Cassirer, uh, the great uh, Neo-Kantian philosopher of that period, and Martin Heidegger. And there were a couple of, they each, one, and, and why am I saying this? Because Levinas was there. Levinas attended this conference. In fact, there is a photo of Levinas at that conference, standing be, beside Eugen Fink, who was the assistant of Edmund Husserl, that we mentioned earlier, and another philosopher of, of some significance uh, named uh, uh, Bulnov. Uh, Levinas attended a, at that time and was even his own presence there was, was noted because he was, he was known by all the attendants of, the, of this uh, conference to be the, the, the young French-speaking thinker who ran around tr translating Heide uh, passages from Heidegger's, at that time, magnum opus, Being in Time, which at that time only existed in German. So the Germans obviously knew how to read it, but the, not, the French people didn't know how to read it so well. So Levinas had these little circles around him uh, at Davos, where he would read Heidegger and translate and explain passages from Heidegger. This was a watershed moment because, because just to go back, both uh, Cassirer and Heidegger delivered different lectures, and there was, they entered into a rather heated controversy in their approach to philosophy at that time. Uh, Cassirer represented the old school philosophers of Kant. We looked actually, in fact, uh, when we looked at Hermann Cohen, Cassirer was very much, I, I believe they knew each other, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know the history so well, but uh, Cassirer was a, uh, yeah, they must have known each other because Cassirer actually published Hermann Cohen's uh, works on, on Immanuel Kant. Uh, so th these, were the, these represented the great, uh, the great intellectual movements of the early, uh, philosophical intellectual German movements of the first half of the 20th century. And Heidegger was the, was the new, the new rising star of that time and, and became the dominant figure of, 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 of German thought and European thought, a modern philosophical thought. And, and this watershed moment was this conference in Davos of, of 19, uh, 1929. As we know, of course, then, the next period in history in Europe it took a very dark uh, turn. Actually, sorry, before that, let me just mention, sorry, before we go to that. Uh, 1930, so the, the following year, Levinas moved to France, uh, to Paris. He, was he had been studying at Strasbourg, as I mentioned, where he received his, uh, his degrees, all his degrees in, in philosophy, and then he moved to France in 1930, which became, from 1930 on to the end of his life, his, his place of residence. He was very proud to be a Frenchman, naturalized Frenchman, of course, he was Lithuanian, but, but his, his entire life he was very patriotic about France, 
probably more more than many people would have liked. Uh, but he was he was a he was a diehard Frenchman, and um, he of course left France a couple of times. Most importantly, in 1932, he went back to Kovno to pick up his wife. Uh, Raisa was somebody that Levinas had known since his childhood. In fact, the Levinas family in Kovno rented their residence from... They, they, they lived in a, in a large house which had two, which was a, a duplex, I guess. It was divided into two. So the Levinas family lived in half of this house and Raisa's family lived in the other half of the house and they rented the, the, the first half to the Levinas family. So Levinas grew up with Raisa from childhood and in 1939 uh, went back to Kovno to propose marriage to her. And she, of course, agreed. And she was very excited to join uh, Monsieur Levinas uh, in his life in Paris. She herself was an accomplished musician. <clears throat> uh, was an, I don't know if she was... She, she was definitely a, somewhat of an intellectual. She Apparently, she was either... People knew her as either sitting at her piano or reading books. Um, so she, she was definitely a, a very clever lady um, and a musician of, of, of some... Um, I, don't, I don't know if she... about her performance career, but definitely their son uh, turned out to, to be a well-known musician. Here they are uh, on holiday, and this is, I believe, is their son, Michael. The previous picture had their daughter. Uh, so here the Levinases are on holiday. This picture, by the way, of the two of them. Um, I, I love this photograph so much that I, I, I printed it out. And when we, when we lived in Yerushalayim, I put it up on my, on my wall. Yeah, I thought I was crazy. She said, you have a picture of them on your wall like they're your grandparents. And I, and I said, yeah, you know what? I kind of feel that they, they kind of are my adoptive grandparents. She actually reminds me of my grandmother a little bit. That's why I like this picture so much. Um, but I, uh, this, their marriage was... N they didn't just have a great marriage. I mean, these are people who were in love their entire lives from childhood, obviously, to, right to the end. <clears throat> but the marriage was actually quite important for totality and infinity. And there are sections at the end of the book where Levinas talks about eros. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it, which are, the language of it is so romantic and erotic. You would think, like, this guy, this guy was a, you know, Don Giovanni of some sort. He writes about eroticism in such a, um, well, it's a very, very, very French way to write about eroticism. Uh, not, not, it's never gross. Levinas was not a gross guy, right? So he's not Georges Bataille or, 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 or Baudelaire, but, but he's, he's writing about eroticism in such powerfully passionate language that you would think that this guy was, was Don Juan, and yet this is a man who was absolutely monogamous and absolutely devoted to, to his wife uh, his entire life. So all of his writing about eroticism and about voluptuousness comes from an in, a very intimate and a very devoted uh, uh, husband. They say apparently that Levinas, when he traveled, he always traveled with his wife, uh, like I do with mine. And apparently he, um, when he would, he would travel to give lectures in different universities, and he, he'd be standing at the podium. People see him standing there nervously fidgeting with, with his paper. He, he always had a folded, folded piece of paper prepared, you know, to, to get notes for him to, uh, for his lecture. He'd be standing there nervously. And he wouldn't start until he saw where his wife was sitting. And as soon as he would see her, he'd, go, he'd calm down, and then, he, and then he would give his lecture. Their son, uh, Michael Levinas, is, is quite famous in the musical scene. Um, as I know from a friend of mine, uh, uh, Gila, uh, from whom I knew in, in Vienna, uh, who knows him personally. So Michael Levinas did, I, I don't know how famous, he's not Mozart, but he did, he is a name, in, definitely a name in, I guess, modern classical music, if that's the right term for it. Uh, this is a talent, obviously, that he picked up from his mother. His mother was his first music teacher, uh, but he did go to have, on to have a distinguished musical career. This is now the dark period of Levinas's life, Levinas was conscripted into the French army. Uh, he mostly worked as an interpreter uh, because he was fluent in German, of course, and uh, um, having lived in Germany and in French, 
So he was he worked as a as a translator or whatever interpreter in the army. But in 1940, as you as of course you know the the, the French army capitulated very quickly to Hitler's onslaught. Um, and in 1940, Levinas found himself in Stalag 11B in Falingbostel, which is close to Hanover in Germany, where he spent five years. He spent five years in captivity. Uh, not a great experience, of course, but because this was a POW camp, not uh, Auschwitz and not uh, Dachau, but it was a POW camp where mostly, I believe, there were British soldiers there, but also a very large contingent of French. Um, so you can see these soldiers don't look very hot, but they definitely look better if you can compare to those pictures of Auschwitz survivors uh, and, and to the, uh, the Muslim men. Um, so Levinas was, did work as a lumberjack for five years, rising early in the morning and coming late at night back into the Stalag. He was a very short guy, Levinas, not, not, not a particularly powerful man. So it was, you can imagine, rather demanding on his physique to be a lumberjack in the forest for five years. Um, and this experience, he, he, he wrote a lot. We actually have his cahier, his uh, notebooks from that period. So he did a lot of writing things down. And in fact, his first book, or rather his second book, uh, De l'existence à l'existant, which is impossible to translate. Even in French, it's actually it's an impossible title. From existence to the existent. So that book really was written in the Stalag and then was published um, afterwards. The, the experience in, in the Stalag and the experience of the war itself um, as I'll, I'll mention, I'll mention that actually last. So let me let me just mention that very briefly. That was really momentous for Levinas's thinking as a whole. Um, his 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 experience of the war. After the war, as I say, I'll return to that in a second. After the war, Levinas. Oh, here's a picture of Levinas. Right up, he's right up here, wearing his what's called a kepi. Uh, in uniform, I assume this must be. At the end of the war, I mean, or maybe at the very beginning, because these guys look like they're in really good shape. They're not emaciated at all, so um, probably at the beginning. So after the war, Levinas returns home. Uh, to discover that his entire family has been killed in the camps and the entire family of his wife. I'll get to, back to that in a second. The, the job that he gets when he, uh, he comes back and he, and he uh, uh, the first job that he gets, I think, is as a secretary at the Alliance Israelite Universelle, a very important uh, organization in France, a Jewish organization. And the, in the following year, 1945, he is appointed the director of the École Normale Israelite Orientale, um, in Paris, uh, the Enyo, or you can see him here, standing in the picture here with the, the faculty and I guess the students behind him. This was a school which catered mostly to North African Jews uh, coming, uh, coming in from the Jewish, from the French uh, diaspora. As you know, North Africa was, was heavily colonized by the French. And so a lot of Jews living in Tangiers, Algiers, and like my wife, uh, born in Casablanca in, in, in Morocco, they started to filter in from these North African countries into Paris. Um, and so the, at the Enyo, where Levinas taught from 1945 to 1979, you had this uh, little Lithuanian Jew dealing with a lot of Moroccan Jews who were for him a bit of a surprising experience because unlike many Ashkenazi Jews, Moroccans typically, as I know firsthand because of my wife's family, Moroccans who weren't necessarily, well, they wouldn't, you wouldn't call them Orthodox, they wouldn't call themselves Orthodox, maybe today they would because they've taken on Ashkenazi, uh, those who have taken on Ashkenazi titles, but Moroccan Jews who were like Levinas traditional, traditional Jews didn't necessarily walk around wearing a kippah in the streets like my father-in-law, um, nevertheless had a very solid 
not of Jewish knowledge. And these are people who spoke Hebrew well, who could basically recite the whole of the book of Tehillim, of, of the book of Psalms by heart, certainly knew all the tefillot by heart, certainly had beautiful voices when they led the davening. Um, so for Levinas, it was a bit of an experience. You know, you're, it, you're having these at North African Jews, which are, as we know, are culturally quite different from European Jews. By European standards, God forbid, I'm not trying to, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not trying to deprecate you know, North African Jews, but by European chauvinistic standards, these are uncultured people, right? They're Arabs, right? So the French, even today, even today, the, the immigrants coming into France are looked down as, as Arabs, you know, low, people of very low culture, and yet these Jewish Arabs have a very solid Jewish education by European standards. Their knowledge of Judaism is much better than an average traditional European Jew. So it's, it's a, it was a very interesting experience for, for Levinas at the Enyo. And uh, he was known there as being a rather stern teacher of Judaism. Uh, he took his job not just very seriously, but he saw it as, as, a, as his mission. One of his great missions in life was to run this, this school where besides teaching uh, and besides running the school, he also gave a long class every Shabbat on Rashi. I believe it was Shabbat, if not Sundays. It was a famous Rashi shiur that Levinas would give that was attended by, by, uh, by people from all over Paris. One of the very, very few times, by the way, this is a, a nice little side story, one of the very, very few times that Levinas missed his Rashi shiur was when he was invited by the newly appointed Pope, uh, John Paul II, not long after he became the Pope, uh, visited Paris and had a little, a little get-together, uh, a little brunch on Saturday morning, uh, somewhere important in, the, in France, where he invited 10 or so of the great, of his favorite personal intellectuals, French intellectuals, Paul Ricoeur and people like that. And Levinas was invited because, I don't know if you know this, about John Paul II, who was not only one of the greatest popes of all time, according to in my books, uh, was not only a great philo-Semite, but was a professor of philosophy. And specifically, a professor of phenomenology. He wrote his doctoral dissertation on uh, with Max Scheller, I believe, on Husserl, if I'm not mistaken. So he was, he was in his own right, a philosopher of phenomenology, uh, an ex expert in phenomenology. And, be, and, of course, he knew of Levinas's work very well, because Levinas brought phenomenology to France. And, of course, since Levinas was a Jew and John Paul II was a Catholic, they had a natural affinity. So John Paul II invited Levinas to brunch on Shabbat. And Levinas walked from the Enyo, from uh, Rue d'Auteuil, uh, to wherever they held their brunch on Shabbat and had to cancel his Rashi, his, his Rashi class. And afterwards, Levinas, by the way, was also invited on a regular basis to Castel uh, Gondolfo, as it's called, in a beautiful site in Italy where the Pope would have an annual meeting of inte intellectuals to talk about religious matters. Finally, I'll just mention, of course, Levinas had many uh, great influences, intellectual influences in, in his life. One of the most important intellectual influences, which came quite late, was a very mysterious figure by the name of Monsieur Shushani. Uh, Mr. Shushani, as you can, might figure out, Shushani is a, not a real name. I mean, it was a name everybody knew him by. Shushan is the city in which the uh, story of Esther takes place, the Megillah. And he named himself after that Mordechai Shushani. Actually, it was his name Mordechai, as you know, is the protagonist of the Megillah. Uh, his, his identity was a great mystery, uh, although it seems, it seems, from a recent discovery, actually, I think it's 2005, there's an Israeli scholar by the name of Yael, whose name, last name I forget, who apparently found some documentation 
that his name is really Hillel Perlman, who was apparently born in, in uh, Belarus, uh, but who definitely died in 1968 in Uruguay, Montevideo. This man, I, and I've, met, I've spoken to people who knew him personally, and the stories you hear about this man are, are very, very difficult to believe, but everybody says that uh, firsthand. This man spoke something like 15 languages fluently, including, besides the European language, besides Hebrew and Aramaic and, and French and English and uh, Spanish and Italian, he also spoke Hungarian fluently, and he also spoke Hindi fluently and Arabic fluently. And besides that, was a genius in mathematics. And besides that, knew the entire Talmud and all the commentators by heart. So uh, apparently he was once teaching in a kibbutz in Israel. He was teaching Talmud and he would walk up and down the classroom and different people were studying different tractates of the Talmud. And, as, and, and he would pick up on what they were saying, either, whether it was in the Talmud or in the Tosvos or the Rashi. And whatever they were saying, he would suddenly recite the rest of it uh, by heart. So this is, this is a man of, of, of scary proportions of genius. Uh, photographic memory, no question, but beyond photographic memory. Uh, this is a man who, who had a wide, wide knowledge of everything. Uh, but his personal appearance and his personal manners were quite disturbing to many people. He, he looked like and he behaved like a hobo. He was dirty, smelly, he didn't live anywhere, he, wa he, he didn't have any, uh, any, any regular residence, he, wa he wandered the earth like this, this he was a wander literally a wandering Jew, like somebody out of mythology, uh, and he would wander into Levinas's life out of nowhere, he would knock on his door and say, hi, I'm here to stay for the next month. Uh, this was the only time apparently when, when Mr. and Mrs. Levinas could be heard fighting, arguing, because she was really bothered by the presence of this guy in her house. He would just, he would live in their house and take over her husband's life for a couple of weeks. He was also a big influence on Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel has a beautiful little story describing this guy. He, he's just a, this wild intellectual who would overtake Levinas's life, and, would, and what, would they, what would they do together? He, he would teach Levinas Talmud. That's what they would do. All day long they would study Talmud, and he taught Levinas how to study Talmud. So we will see, we'll have an occasion to look in, in, the, in the book uh, how Levinas every once, in all, in, every once in all mentions le maître, the master or the teacher. And this, everyone agrees, is an allusion to Monsieur Shushani, Mr. Mr. Shushani, who would barge in on his life and, and teach him Talmud. Levinas was a a known intellectual figure in the Parisian scene, the Parisian intellectual scene, until 1961. But in 1961, when he published this book, Totality Infinity, he became a very major uh, intellectual figure, especially after Derrida, by the way. Derrida was the first person to write a serious, critical analysis of Totality and Infinity. And once Derrida, who was well known at that time, wrote this essay, uh, then people began to take Levinas incredibly seriously. He became a major, major figure. So this book is, is, is something is a text that Levinas began to write in 1955, apparently in the city of Evian, for where, where we get Evian water, uh, in Lake, on, which is on the a little town on the on Lake, Lake Geneva. And he worked on this text for six years. He was going to publish it. Actually, a cute little story, not so cute, but an interesting little story. His first attempt to publish it uh, with, uh, with uh, Gaimard was, came to frustration. The publisher sent them back the manuscript and said, sorry, this is, not, this is not really a text. This is not really a text worth publishing. And apparently he fell into such panic and depression that he started ripping up the text and his manuscript, and he wanted to, to throw it into the fire and had to be stopped from doing so. Uh, and then uh, a friend of his, uh, a, 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 I believe it's a Jesuit monk friend, uh, agreed to publish it, but the publication was stopped by another very important friend, Jean Val, 
who was a really important intellectual in the French intellectual scene. And he told, he, he called the publisher immediately. He said, stop the press. We're not publishing this. Levinas is going to defend this. First, before we publish it, he is going to defend it as his uh, doctorat, as uh, his thèse de doctorat, as his doctoral thesis. And he did defend it, of course, successfully. And Jean Val, who was at that defense, many, many great intellectuals actually were at that defense. And Jean Val, at that defense, said, this is a book that is destined to become a great great work on philosophy, and he was, of course, right. Uh, it did become a very influential work. As soon as the book was published, Levinas's in, uh, university career was launched. Until then, he was not a university pro professor. He, only, uh, he was, in, I think he was my age, actually. He was exactly my age. He was 56, 57, um, and he had, only t he had been a known intellectual, but his main job was teaching at the, at the University of, um, at, at, the, at the ENU, uh, but then in 1961, with the publication of this book, he, he, he was taken on at the uh, Université de Poitiers. All of these are in, in, in Paris, and then Nantes, and finally in 73, at the, he became a uh, professor at the Sorbonne. It just doesn't get better than that. And, um, and um, yeah, the rest is history. I'll end with this one. Any questions on that? I want to look at this one interesting text, uh, because I, think, I personally think this is the most important dimension of his uh, biography. But before I get to that, any questions about what I've said so far? You guys have been very quiet. No thoughts? No? Okay. This is now a um, text, which I'll read very, very quickly here. It's the only thing that Levinas ever himself wrote that is anything like a biography. He didn't like the idea of biographies. Um, I... You know, I'm sorry I'm tr showing off here, but I, this is a book that I translated uh, 20 years ago, believe it or not. Uh, it's one of the two biographies of Levinas. Um, fr both were written in French. This was a biography uh, by Salomon Malka, who was one of his students at the Enyo. Um, and he mentions in, um, in this biography that Levinas really hated the idea of biographies. <laughs> he found the whole thing rather stupid. Um, so... Um, in my, I have a short preface here, which, in my, which I, in my point, point of departure on that essay, is that a very, the fact that, essay, that, that Levinas did not like biographies, uh, but then I do, I do quote this autobiographical paragraph that Levinas uh, included in a, in a book which he published immediately after Totality and Infinity, uh, a book called Difficile Liberté, Difficult Liberty, which is a, an anthology of essays on Judaism. So in this, in this book, in Totality and Infinity, Levinas doesn't talk much about Ju Judaism. Uh, we will have to bring out the Jewish subtext. Uh, but he does discuss Judaism very, very squarely in A Difficult Liberty. And in there, he has this short biography, which he updated. And the updating is very interesting. Uh, I'll tell you, what, well, you'll see in a second why. The biography goes like this. He just, it's just basically an itinerary, right, of his life. The Hebrew Bible from the childhood years of Lithuania, Pushkin, Tolstoy, the Russian Revolution of 1917, experienced at the age of 11 in the Ukraine, from 1923, University of Strasbourg, where Charles Blondel, Halbwachs, uh, and so on, later Giro, whatever we're teaching, friendship with Maurice Blanchot, whom we looked at, um, and through his eyes, they were adolescents, uh, and through the teacher's eyes, not his eyes, because he's too young for that, were adolescents at the time of the Dreyfus, the famous case of, uh, the Dr of Dreyfus, the Dreyfus Affair, a vision dazzling for a new couple of a people who equal humanity and of a nation to which one can attach oneself by a spirit and heart as much as by roots. So here Levinas is telling us that he is a patriotic Frenchman, even though he's not from France originally. Then a stay in Freiburg, 1929, an apprenticeship be uh, began with Jean Her Her Herring, or Herring, who was a student of Husserl, who was the first person to introduce him to Husserl. Then the Sorbonne, whatever, Léon Brunschwig, the philosophical avant-garde, and the soirees of Gab Gabriel Marcel, who was a famous Catholic uh, philosopher at that time. Intellectual, anti-intellectual scenes, refinement of Jean Val, as we mentioned earlier, who was very influential in public publishing this. Confer conferences at the Collège Philosophique, which were headed by Jean Val. Then the directorship of the uh, Enyo, training teachers of the French and so on at the Alliance Israelite Universelle, 
daily communication with Henri Nerson, who was his best friend at the Enyo, and frequent visits from Monsieur Chouchani, uh, the prestigious and merciless teacher and, of exegesis and Talmud and of Talmud, annual conferences like from 1957 on uh, of the Jewish French intellectuals, which is important because this is where Levinas de developed what came to be called his Talmudic lectures. He would, we'll have a chance to look at that a little bit. Talmudic, uh, a little text where he would analyze a sugya, a section of a Talmud and give it in a philosophical manner. The thesis of 1961, which is this book, The Professorship at Poitiers, Nantes, and finally at the Sorbonne. This disparate inventory is a biography. Now here, after this long list, one sentence. It is dominated by the presentiment and the memory of the Nazi horror. This whole biography, very interesting, this whole biography, he's giving you a list of his whole life, and he says, oh, by the way, this whole life of mine has been dominated, dominated by the presentiment, not just the memory of the Nazi horror. The, Nazi, the, the, Nazi, the, the memory of the Nazi horror we would understand, right? There's a man who lived through it, whose enti entire life finally was killed by the Nazis. But the presentiment, he had a presentiment. He wrote an essay early on in 1933, called Hitlerism, where he had this feeling that something was coming of that sort. Um, I, have to, I have to thank my friend uh, Una Eisenstadt, who's a, a philosopher, uh, an old friend of mine who's a philosopher and a great Levinas scholar, uh, whom I knew in Toronto, who lives in, in California. Uh, in her book on Levinas, uh, she deals with this, and I, I took her, her writing as a cue to, to write my little essay in, in this book about this, about the importance of this one sentence, this domination of the president, the pr presentiment and the memory of the Nazi horror, it, it seems to me that when you write a sentence like that, you're saying, he's telling you that, you know, everything else up here could, could be classified under what people, uh, under what uh, intellectual biographers, people who do intellectual biography usually call the influence on a person's thinking. You have this idea, oh yeah, he was influenced by that. He met this person and he was influenced. You know, he met Monsieur Shushani, he was very influenced by him. He was very influenced by Husserl and by Heidegger. And the, that's a good word, influence. I was in, my thinking is influenced by many people. But when you separate a sentence like, my thinking was dominated by the Nazi horror, that's no longer influence. You can't say, oh yeah, he was influenced by Nazism. That's not influence. That, that's telling you that something much greater than influence is going on in this person's mind. His whole thinking, his whole cast of mind is operating under the, this Nazi horror. Sorry, may I yeah. ask, in which year was that written? In which year was it written? Th that, that, uh, this, this text? Yes. So it, what's interesting is that uh, the, uh, this book, Difficile Liberté, was published twice. The first time was in 19, uh, in the, I believe it's 1962 or something like that, I don't remember the exact year. In that edition, this line is missing. And then it was republished again, the same book, 1974, if I'm not mistaken, and this line is added, which I find very intriguing. Yeah, I'm not. Why do you, th why? I'm not, because uh, basically uh, for me it's uh, what was happening uh, in France, uh, after 69. Uh, it's like disregarding what happened in the Soviet Empire, uh, in the Soviet Union and before that International Empire. And uh, uh, in France in the late 60s and 70s, only uh, out of the two totalitarian regimes, only uh, the German was uh, from that one. Uh, that's my impression. Was from? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, for, for in my understanding, like yeah. if you think of Sartre or the war or basically anyone from the late 60s, uh, they uh, accepted, even in terms of anti Semitism, what happened in Russia and later in the Soviet Union, but they didn't what happened in Germany. Ah, Europe. very good, yes. And I, I think mean, you're absolutely uh, right. Yes. It's uh, disregarding uh, what happened in Lithuania and uh, in that period, because that was, uh, when he was born, that was still uh, well into the pogroms. Right. And uh, writing that, it, he became French, 
Right. He'd be in exactly. That, in that aspect, he'd be careful. I'm so glad you said that, Alexander, because I, th I think that's dead on. I think it's absolutely right. I think I think in the 60s he he was a little bit uneasy about writing such a sentence. The Holocaust was not yet a theme. You know, there's a great book by by a scholar named uh, Novik, uh, which deals with America. He talks about the uh, the, uh, the the um, Holocaust in, in the uh, American mind. Uh, where he says, really, the Holocaust only became a real theme for thinking uh, with the Six Day War, 1967, which I think is an interesting argument. Um, you know, there's some self-hating Jews like uh, Finkelstein who, t who take that to the bank, but never mind him. Um, the Holocaust did not become a, uh, a real issue, you know, in, before for, th for thinking, for intellectuals, until at least the Six Day War. So I think Levinas, not that he was, you know, ashamed of being Jew. He wasn't ashamed of being Jewish or anything like that. But, you know, th this is a Frenchman who doesn't necessarily want to, you know, point fingers and make people feel bad, right? By 1974, when it's, Elie Wiesel has published his book and everybody knows, everyone is reading Night and everyone is reading all these Holocaust texts and it's become a theme and the whole guilt, the whole guilt mongering the whole guilt business, you know, Jews making the non-Jews feel guilty left and right, that becomes a dominant, a, a very important trope. The trope is still being exploited to some extent. It's not, it's, it it's losing its mileage, but definitely became an important trope. And at that point, Levinas has no qualms about saying, you know what, you know what, if, if I may tell you quite frankly, my thinking has been dominated by this, right? Then he tells, then he, he, it's a confession. At this point, he feels comfortable confessing that this that that the Holocaust has dominated his thinking. Yeah. I'm just curious because you say uh, it really only became a mode of thinking in after the Six Day War, uh, but the Six Day War is all uh, uh, multiple years after the Eichmann trial, which was an international media frenzy, and everyone writes about it. Does he basically say? He Look, Novik's. I don't. You know, people dispute Novik's thesis. There are there have been books also against Novik. Um, that, that, that say, no, he's way, is exaggerating. Novik's thesis, I, I think he's right in the sense that it became what, you know, what has been called the, the, out, the, the, the Holocaust industry. If you know this, there's a book called The Holocaust Industry by Finkelstein. Mm -hmm. Or Finkelstein just, I mean, Finkelstein is just, he goes ballistic with it. He has a point, by the way, I'm not totally against Finkelstein's book. I think he's right. There is such a thing as a Holocaust industry. There is a show up biz. Right? Jews, Jews have gone. Uh, Jews did go. I think a little bit too far, you know, with <coughs> squeezing, you know, the showbiz, and, and we're and we're paying for it now, right? The the, the resurgence of anti-Semitism across the world is is non-Jews being a little sick and tired of being, you know, told that you know their parents and grandparents were were Jew killers. So there's no, no there, definitely it, it was a thing. I'm, all I'm saying, all that all that Novik was saying is that basically the showbiz began in in 67. And it's all an American and Israeli conspiracy, basically, right? This is a time when Isra Israeli politics were precarious and Israeli, Israel wanted to solidify its relationship to America, desperately needed to, because the danger of the Arab world was very big at that time. It, the Israelis thought, they, they, the Israelis seriously thought this was the end. And Jews worldwide, American Jews were scared that this was the end. My father fought in that war. Right? People, people were, 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 thought this was going to be, you know, hit, hit, Hitler's, Hitler was going to finally have his dream come true in 67. And so Jews were scrambling to, to make Israel, the importance, the importance of Jews a theme. And so they dredged up the Holocaust in a major uh, uh, prop propagandistic way to say, hey, you know, you tried to kill us, you know, you tried to kill, you killed six million of us, you tried, there was an attempt at genocide, this is happening again, you know, and, and so it became a major trope in Jewish thinking and writing, which is why today we have Holocaust studies. It's a whole, it's not just a theme, it's a field, it's a field of study, you know, like Jewish thought and like Jewish literature, you have a thing called Holocaust studies, as if it's its own you know, it's like having, imagine such a thing as inquisition studies.
As far as I know, there's no such thing. I mean, maybe there are a couple of places in the world where they do have, where they specialize in the Spanish Inquisition, but it's not a field of studies, you know, Inquisition studies, or or uh, Churban Bayes Shaney studies, you know, the destruction of the Second Temple State. It's not, a, it's not a field, but Holocaust studies is a field. Or, or Russian pogrom studies. It's not a field. So, but you're definitely right, Sam, that even as early as uh, 1945, as soon as the war was over, there was definitely publications already coming out. You know, there were already all kinds of testimonies coming out. Elie Wiesel's testimony came out very early. I forget which year, but it was, in the, it was in the 40s, if I'm not mistaken, or definitely in the 50s, when, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Welt hat geschwiegen, the, the Yiddish uh, version of Night came out first, and so on. This, by the way, so th this same year I mentioned Difficile Liberté, which is when, when he uh, rewrote this preface, was also the year of his second magnum opus, his first magnum opus, his first great book is Totality and Infinity, his second one was published in 1974, uh, Autrement Quatre, Otherwise Than Being, very Heideggerian title. Um, and in the dedication page, this is a, the, a picture I took last night of my edition of, uh, of Autrement Quatre, the dedication page, you see first of all on the bottom, in Hebrew letters, he writes, Le Nishmas Avi Moiri Reb Yechiel, Ben Reb Avram Halevi, in the memory of the soul of my father and teacher, Rabbi Yechiel, son of Avram HaLevi, Levi, because Levinas, right? Ami Morasi Dvora Bas Reb Moshe, my mother, Dvora, the daughter of Reb Moshe, Achi Dov Ben Reb Yechiel HaLevi, Ve'amina Dov Ben Rechiel Yechiel HaLevi, my brother Yechiel, my, my brother Dov and my brother uh, Amina Dov, Choisni, uh, my father-in-law, Reb Shmuel ben Gershom Alevi, his father-in-law was interesting, also a Levi, um, and uh, and and uh, Nasi Makabas Reb Yechaim, and my mother-in-law. So his his parents, his brothers, his wife's family, were were killed in Auschwitz. So it's not just that he survived. It's back for five years in Fallings uh, Fallingsbostel, uh, Fallingsbostel in Germany. His whole, he, when he came back from the war, he came back to learn that his entire family on every side was, was wiped out by, by Hitler. So when he says that his thinking is dominated by the Nazi horror, you know, he's, he's dead serious about that. And we're not talking about a philosophical influence. I kind of harp on that because, you know, I, 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 this is an argument that I tried to make in, in my little preface to this book. And, and my friend, uh, uh, Philippe Nemo, who was a student of Levinas, a very important student of Levinas, who published, who was instrumental in making, him, uh, making him famous in France, uh, because he published an interview with him early on. So Philippe Nemo took objection to that. You know, he said, "Michael, I, I don't mind, by the way. I, I love Philippe Nemo. He's, he's a friend of mine. I haven't spoken in years, but in any case, but Philippe said, uh, you know, I think uh, Kegel is going a little bit too far, and I he think he's like, exaggerating the importance of the call of Holocaust. So it's not. I understand why he would say that. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not holding a grudge against anyone. I'm, I just want to mention that because, because I think it's important. It's important to understand. My 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 view of this is that it's important to understand how the Holocaust is not." an influence on Levinas's thought. It's the matrix of his thinking. It's the, it's the horizon in which totality and infinity is taking place. And we're gonna see that, we're gonna to turn to, I, I guess we have to take a break at this point, have some lunch and turn off our, our, uh, our buddies here who are joining us online. Uh, I hope maybe they'll join us tomorrow. Uh, we're gonna to turn to uh, the, um, the preface of totality and infinity where in the very first line, we see an allusion to the Second World War and, and to the Holocaust. Um, just, to, just to quickly translate the dedication at the top, à la mémoire des êtres les plus proches parmi les six millions d'assassinés par les nas, nas, uh, nationaux socialistes in the memory of the beings, it's a funny French word, of the beings who were most close, in other words, his family, among the six million who were assassinated by the National Socialist, à côté des millions et des millions d'humains de, 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 de toute confession, de toute nation, among the millions upon millions of human beings of all confessions, in other words, of all religions, right? Not just Jews. He wants to stress that, and of all nations, victimes de la même de la même haine de l'autre homme, victims 
of the same hatred of the other human. This is going to become an absolutely, absolutely central expression. L'autre homme, the other human. Du même antisemitism. Interesting addition. Of the same antisemitism. Victims, again, victims of the same hatred of the other human being, the same antisemitism. In other words, what, what is, he, he, what is he, Levinas saying here? He's saying that if you hate a human being, you're an anti-Semite. But I'm not, I don't hate human beings. I hate Pakistanis. I hate Eskimos. You know, I hate the the the, tuts, the Tutsus, the, tu, the Tutsis, or whatever. The right. Levinas says when you hate the Tutsis, or when you hate you know the Bosnians, or if you hate Russians, or if you hate Ukrainians, you're an anti-Semite. How exactly is that anti-Semitism? Um, you know what, I'll, I'll tell you how it is, I, since I mentioned Nemo, Nemo is on my mind. Nemo once told me, uh, I hope he did, uh, <laughs> he's not watching this, but um, I don't think he'd mind me sharing this story. Um, I, I found it an interesting story. Uh, Nemo and I once, uh, Philippe and I once had a long conversation. Of course, I wanted to know everything he knew about Levinas. Uh, I was drinking in his words. And he said, you know, once Levinas and I were talking and I asked him, uh, you know, être juif, être c'est quoi? What, what, is it, what does it mean to be a Jew? And, uh, and Levinas said, said, you know, being a Jew means caring about the other human being. It's being ethical. It's being having social awareness. It's being political, right? It's being everything they're going to read uh, in this book. And Philippe Nemo, he said, you know, may... Professor Levinas, but that's, that's me, you're describing me. Philippe Nemo is not Jewish, he said, but, you, but you're describing me. And Philippe said to me, he said, he said, Levinas said, well, then you are effectively Jewish. I don't know how he said it exactly, he said, but you know, if that's how you feel, you're basically Jewish, right? Which is, which is beautiful thought, I think. I mean, I don't know, you know, Levinas was not making a halachic statement. I mean, I'm a halachic Jew, so obviously I'm not suggesting that, that that should become a halachic definition of what it means to be a Jew. That, you know, you can be a Jew simply if, you're, if you have social awareness, right? Obviously, Jude, to be a Jew, you have to go through the, through the conversion process, which is not an, as in, not an easy process. But, but, there is something beautiful, and something not just beautiful, something profoundly meaningful about this idea that, that being Jewish is being human. And that being human, if you understand, if you understand what humanism is, if you understand the essence of humanism, then you understand the essence of Judaism. Semitism is not just about, you know, being Jewish. It's not just about being born Jewish. Not just about being circumcised and eventually keeping halacha or not. And it's certainly not just about eating matzo balls uh, and gefilte fish, you know, and watching Woody Allen movies and enjoying Sasha Baron Cohen. Uh, Judaism is about a certain, um, in essence, Judaism is about a commitment to humanity, which is why, as we read in this week's Parsha, Judaism does not begin with Jews. The first few generations of the story that we consider Jewish, the few, first few generations begin with Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Enosh and Seth and so on, these are not Jews. They're not Jewish people going all the way to Noah, right? We didn't, we didn't get, we didn't, in fact, we went through a whole Parsha. There's no Jews in any, of, in any of it. There's a full Parsha without any Jews in it, right? We're going to read Parsha's Noah. Parsha's Noah also has no Jews in it. It's only at the end of Parsha's Noah that finally, even, even then we don't have a Jew. We have a guy called Abraham, who, strictly speaking, is not Jewish. Right? Abraham's not Jewish. He's the father of the Jewish people, but he's not Jewish himself. He's a Hebrew. So what does that tell you? It tells you that Judaism begins, has its source, in something that is not Judaism, in a humanism, in a kind of humanism. A humanism that is, of course, revealed in the Torah and in Hebrew, but is not, but is not exactly Judaism. And in a sense, I think Levinas is saying that with this interesting phrase at the end of the dedication uh, to his book on uh, Otherwise Than Being, the, the, le même, du même antisemitisme, the same antisemitism. That Hitler, when Hitler, Yemach Shemot, launched his enterprise of genocide against the Jewish people, it was not just an attack on Judaism, it was an attack on humanity. 
And by the way, I think you can prove this in all kinds of interesting ways. I don't know if you know this, but the very first, uh, the prototype of Auschwitz was a program called the T4 program, which was a program uh, to which Hitler, which Hitler signed. We have actually have Hitler's signature on a document for a program to kill mentally retarded and, and, and socially uh, asozial, that was the, was the German uh, term for people who are socially misfits. Um, and they, these people were, were gassed to death, were killed by injections and by gas, by the, the proto-elimination uh, program, which had very few Jewish victims. Very few Jewish victims, as, you know, proportionately. Had thousands upon thousands of German victims. We're talking about children, German children, German children who were retarded, who were handicapped, who, who had all kinds of problems, and these, they were killed because they were asozial, because they were unwertiges Leben. They were a, 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 a life, life not worthy of living, right? What does that tell you? That tells you that the, that the, the inner truth of Nazism is connected to an anti-humanism. And when Levinas, the Jew, puts up a fight against the inner truth of Nazism, using the inner truth of Judaism, not using text, Levinas does not quote the Talmud and the Mishnah and Medrash or the Chumash even, he hardly yards of quotes it, quotes these texts, when he's, when he's taking on these ways of thinking, the inner truth of Nazism, which Heidegger essentially espoused, he's, he's doing it on behalf of a humanism which is effectively synonymous with Jewish teaching, with the Jewish te teaching of humanity. Again, I don't want to reduce, I don't want you to think that I'm reducing Judaism to humanism, but I think it is essential to see that the essence of humanism, the essence of Judaism rather, is a type of humanism. It, it is basically humanistic teaching. And of course, anyone who's Christian and anyone who's Muslim programmatically, systematically, is, is committed to that humanism also. Christianity has its problems with Judaism. Judaism has its problems with Christianity and, and in very recent history with, with Islam as well. But on a deeper level, there really is no conflict. Christianity has basically, basically picked up the, the torch uh, of, of, of Jewish humanism as it was taught in the Hebrew Bible and gave it a, a, a Christian spin. And, and so insofar as we're talking about this humanistic teaching, this is something that Franz Rosenzweig develops at great length and we'll have the chance to develop with one of the greatest Rosenzweig scholars alive, who, thank God, is on our faculty at the Ashkenazium, uh, Paul Franks, God willing, will have him here in, in the summertime to lead us through a reading of Franz Rosenzweig on this, on, you know, and we'll touch on this point as well. Should we take a break? Everybody hungry? Sure. Yeah? Okay. Okay.